uh, introduction of the panel members and uh, uh, myself. So uh, thank you uh, once again and uh, welcome to this uh, 20th uh, round of Harvard India conference. And uh, today's uh, theme is what will it take to annihilate uh, caste by 2047. This is a very tall order. So before uh, uh, we go to the panelists for the discussion, I just want to uh, give the brief uh, introduction about the, or the context about the caste issue and um, the magnitude uh, and the spread of the ca caste issue. So if we uh, take the numbers, the sheer numbers, Dalits are scheduled caste people in India constitute 16.63 percent of the total population. Though in the olden uh, 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 system, Dalits were out of the caste system. They were nowhere in the caste system, but that was applied to Dalits and uh, the discrimination is happening. And similarly, even though scheduled tribes are not there in the caste system, still the discrimination on the basis of caste is happening against uh, scheduled tribes who constitute 8.61% of the population uh, as per 2011 census. And the OBCs, other backward uh, uh, classes, which constitute, uh, as per 1931 population census, it was 52%. When the first backward classes commission in 1953 gave its report in 1955, they said that uh, the population of other backward uh, classes has been increasing. It should be more than 52%, but not less than 52%. And again, that was reiterated uh, by the BP Mandal uh, uh, Commission, uh, another uh, backward uh, classes uh, commission, which gave its reports in uh, 1980. There is a report in 2006 uh, by the NSSO, which says that uh, the other backward uh, classes population is around 41%, but that is uh, contested. So I am more inclined to take uh, the population uh, as uh, uh, enumerated in the census and various uh, BC commissions, that is 52%. So cl clubbing all these three, 16.63, 8.61, and 52, it comes to 77.24% of the Indian population. In terms of absolute numbers, that comes to 935 million out of 12, 10 million. That is the Africa continent population in 2011 was around 1,000 million. And the population discriminated on the basis of caste is 935 million. So that is the magnitude. The entire African continent, little less than the entire uh, population of African continent, is being discriminated on the basis of uh, caste, excluding other forms of uh, discrimination. So this is in terms of uh, the sheer numbers. If you take the various areas where uh, caste is being uh, uh, operating, India lives in its villages. Around 70% of India's population lives in villages. And India has around 650,000 villages. A recent survey by University of Mangalore has come out that the households of Dalits are located on the margins or at the ends of the village. 95.8% of the households of Dalits and scheduled tribes, in case they are living, are at the margins of the villages. When it comes to education, Oxfam India has a recent uh, a report uh, in the nature has, in terms of faculty members, in terms of undergraduation students, graduation student, PhD students in top Indian institutions, whether it is IITs or IIMs or IASC, various institutions, even though the mandate is, the affirmative action mandate is 15% and 7% and 27% in uh, various uh, uh, educational uh, institutions, that is not yet reached. It is falling far below uh, than that. So, and recent uh, incidents of uh, Cisco case and Google case and uh, European Union's declaration uh, uh, banning caste discrimination and uh, recent episodes in Australia, they all point towards the 
geographical spread of caste across the globe now. In 1916, while uh, giving uh, his thesis, Dr. Ambedkar has told caste is going to be a global problem and that has become a global problem truly if we observe all these aspects. So in terms of the sheer numbers and the spread, global spread of the issue and the various uh, aspects uh, it touches, be it housing, be it health, be it uh, education, you name any uh, area that is being touched by the caste. Dr. Ambedkar again uh, told it's a multi-headed hydra which crosses your path whichever direction you turn. So, and that is what is happening. So, with this uh, uh, introduction or context, so I would like to uh, invite uh, Chandraban Prasad to give us the macro uh, perspective and also the various previous attempts. There was uh, historical attempts at annihilation of caste. There was a revolution against caste and there was counter-revolution in the olden days and also in the medieval period also there were some attempts at the annihilation of caste. But again, there were counter uh, uh, revolutions. Even our constitution is an effort in the direction of uh, removing the caste. In 2006, uh, the then uh, Prime Minister, sitting Prime Minister has for the first time told that compared the untouchability with the apartheid and he told it's a blot on the humanity, not only like, you know, uh, on the Indian context, but on, a, on the humanity. So there was, the, that was the first acknowledgement of uh, 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 hum, uh, untouchability. In 2019 survey, it was pointed out in a report that 25% of families in India still practice untouchability and it is more in the urban areas. And out of those who practice untouchability, more than 25% of it's where the family has people who are educated, who are graduate and above. So it's not that it's only happening in the rural areas or illiterate families. It's happening across educated families, urban, rural, everywhere. So in this context, so I would uh, invite uh, Chandrabanji, why and how the caste is surviving, sustaining and thriving uh, all these uh, years and uh, what are the ways to ensure that uh, this is annihilated uh, by uh, 2047. Chandrabanji, over to you. Thank you, sir. And uh, good morning, Jai Bhim, to all. I am working on a book, <coughs> Future of Caste by 2050. And today I spoke on the topic in the Times of India Literature Festival <coughs> in Delhi. As far as I can see, it is a dharma yuddh going on between caste and capitalism. And I am reporting from village Dharwara, a very large village in East Uttar Pradesh district of Ajamgarh. The village has, uh, I am calling it Dharm Yudh because you have a Krishna's message to Arjun, where he says, whenever there is a decline of dharma, yada yada, uh, uh, that famous uh, sloka, I will take rebirth. If you, whichever uh, edition of uh, Bhagavad Gita, you read. You read it, read uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita of uh, Iskan, that is Krishna consciousness, or <coughs> Ramakrishna mission. 
and read the commentary. Krishna would be born whenever Varnasam Dharma would be under threat. And from Kautilya's Arsas to Manusmriti to uh, 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 to, to Bhagavad Gita, to Gandhi ji, to Baba Sahib Ambedkar, to Dalit writer H. L. Dusad ji, to Thakur Kamalars, Brahmin Kamalars in Ajamgarh district. Dharma means duty, duty means your caste duty. So, caste order stands on the twin principles of blood purity and occupation purity. Now the battlefield Dharwara village that I am talking about, I am studying five villages for the book uh, that I am writing for the Mercatus Center, the Jaj Mason University. There are uh, 204 uh, Thakur families in this village. Out of 204 Thakur families, 60 1.3% Thakur families have farmland up to 1.65 acres, less than 2 acres today. What will be that land holding pattern by 2050? More so, as the data we have, out of 288 Dalit households, 262 Dalits have migrated to cities. And their average age is 30 years. And they have settled in cities as industrial workers. Now, with declining land holding pattern, the fashion statement in Dalit hamlets, there are three Dalit hamlets in Darbara village, 262 migrants, three Grocery shops, four grocery shops have come up within 15 years. And lifestyle changes, like, uh, please don't mind, the shops are selling filter cigarettes. And uh, only a generation back, those Dalits who were born from hungry stomachs are now smoking cigarettes. All the four shops I visited sell fair and lovely beauty cream. I am not for all those creams, but I never thought in my life that Dalit women would be able to apply beauty creams in their lives. There is a beauty parlor uh, nearby this village, there is a bazaar where a Thakur woman, woman runs a beauty parlor and she comes on order in Dalit hamlets also at the time of wedding to beautify Dalit would-be brides. And uh, this uh, Dalit hamlet has about three dozen Dalit men and women who are suffering from diabetic. I never thought that Dalits will ever have diabetes in their lives. No, they have diabetes because there is some leisure time to them. They play cards after lunch. And finally, 
there are dalit women 20 to 25 who go on morning walk in this village and i ask them halkar aa rahi hai in hindi nahi nahi hum walking par gaye the so this massive labor shortage created by economic reforms 10 15 years back the workers agent from faridabad delhi bombay nagpur ahmedabad would visit azamgarh villages take 10 dalit 20 dalits along and would supply them to various uh, factories as i am born in a village in eastern Uttar pradesh a very feudal uh, village once dalits are safer in factory sheds than landlords farms dalit only elderly dalit women work for thakur ex landlords newly wed dalit women and daughters in the dalit hamlet do not work even on their own farms so what will happen by the 2050 when no Dalit will be at all available to work for the Thakurs or for anybody? What will be the future of caste? And uh, to the Thakur side, Three Thakurs in this village grow goats the way poor Dalits do even today in every village because it is a cash crop. Five Dalits, five Thakurs are raising chicken the way most Dalit households used to raise to get to earn cash in emergencies. Now, Thakur are doing it. Thakur women, I had titled, I was titling the book Cast Drowning in the Dead of Night. Thakur women do work around their houses in the pre dawn so that none could see them. Thakur men clean shit of their cows are buffaloes. Thakur women in, in the dead of night make uh, cow dungs. So once it would take 20 to 30 years, I in my village, my friend got married and uh, I haven't seen face of his wife. So those who maintain parda for 20, 30, 40 years are now coming out of their homes because Dalits have completely withdrawn from their farms and homes. So I see caste will go by two kinds of actions. One is law. Baba Sahib Ambedkar's law, state capitalism, as per our uh, uh, counting, Dalits make annually, Dalit government officers and uh, employees make uh, US $50 billion every, every year. So, constitution is there and Dalit capitalism, that is public sector. There are 253 public sectors that are, some of them are uh, in the fourth list that Ambedkar's dream of uh, uh, Dalit capitalism, I would say. The second aspect is an annihilation of villages. So long as villages stay, our Dalits continue staying in villages, caste will be there. I see a very grim future for the caste order by 
2050 in at least five villages under my study thank you for the patience thank you uh, uh, mr chandrabhan prasad that was a, uh, a great uh, uh, experiential and uh, practical uh, solutions one is by law and the other is annihilation of uh, the villages itself dr ambedkar uh, while speaking has told uh, the villages are den of the caste you know uh, system and unless and until uh, urbanization happens the removal of uh, annihilation or removal or annihilation of caste is not possible and you have brought out uh, these things very pertinently and uh, there are uh, large audience here i just wanted to uh, uh, remind them it's a safe uh, space uh, for everybody to express uh, their views and those who are attending uh, virtually also any uh, uh, un- unsavory remarks or caste slurs are uh, not allowed so now moving on uh, with uh, whatever uh, chandrabhan uh, has told so basically he is telling law and uh, the urbanization and the capitalism we move on to the uh, next speaker who is working uh, with the grassroots empowerment of oppressed castes uh, in india so uh, now satyendra kumar so how will this grassroots empowerment of uh, the people who are oppressed in india will lead to annihilation of uh, caste and various uh, reformative uh, actions which were uh, implemented uh, with the implementation of constitution of india in 1950 do you think they have actually enabled the upward movement if you so if you think so to what extent and uh, what are the steps that are required uh, for india to move towards annihilation of caste yeah. thank you and good morning and jai bhim to everyone uh, first of all uh, thanks for uh, for this space where i can uh, uh, freely express and talk about the the system which uh, mr chandradu has given the context and we are saying that uh, uh, we all know that and we are saying that india is is a country of villages i am landing here after walking 1000 miles uh, in indian villages and i just landed day before yesterday and on the basis of my experience of 15 years working on the grassroots i say india is not a country of villages india is a country of habitations and every village is based on caste and religion and certain certain ethnic groups and everybody is situated into in their own context and every habitation has its own caste norms and own practices which they still follow and which is which goes from untouchability to unseeable situation where they even don't want to see certain caste groups into their villages into their habitations so i call it like it's 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 a habitation based society and uh, and and each habitation the norms of the caste goes against the democracy and the constitutional principles of equality justice fraternity and lib- liberty what happens like if the democracy is in threat every day and every day people are uh, practicing this kind of a uh, uh, caste based discriminations my question in my head was how does the democracy is working even in the situation when the caste system is so uh, grave and the untouchability and practices of caste based discrimination so high and this is what made me to walk through the villages and try to understand the democracy from the perspective of the people common uh, from the dalit community and every habitation i have been there i one thing i have been asking and i have been trying to find out that wha- how the democracy is functioning even if there is so much of hate discrimination and segregations and the only thing the dalit community and they keep telling me is that that they believe that the only democracy can help them to get out of the situation democracy or indian constitution what they have and uh, the data is there to say that okay what they don't have what they have is two things which they 
proud for it. And one is that the voting rights, that's it, I have a vote, I know whom to get, who to, who to elect, and I have a constitution which safeguards my situation in the villages. And these two things actually create a lot of aspirations among the generation, among the new generation and also among the community. And these aspirations comes very strongly. But this, this aspiration doesn't uh, come easily. I mean, it, every aspirations of the Dalit community is met by a breach of peace or it leads to violence. You, uh, you get into education system, you hold lands, you, you think of upward mobility, it, it has retaliation. The, the retaliation is in, it comes in the forms of violence, extreme form of violence, and uh, the data also says that like every year, thousands of caste-based discrimination, caste-based uh, cases are uh, recorded and many goes unrecorded. The honor killing is, is very uh, prevalent in almost every, village, every habitation you go. You can't even think of like, okay, that you can fall in love with other community or you can marry with other, other caste groups. I mean, that's, that's not allowed at all. And then any aspirations will meet certain kind of violence. Now, the question here is that uh, even in that, that uh, whole situation uh, where the caste-based discrimination is practiced and aspirations are growing up, how it is actually manifested, how these aspirations are taken care by the state or or the law or the constitution, I would say that uh, there are affirmative action. It's not that there is no affirmative action. Affirmative actions are into two parts. Basically, one is in terms of policies, schemes, special budgets, programs, all are there in place. And we can have like a lot of things, to, data to explain that how, how that is accessible or not accessible. But the major part of the discussion which comes always is the reservation and affirmative action that the reservation is given to Dalit communities. Uh, 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 in in education, in jobs, and in political space, and that is helping out. I just want to uh, take few examples of how reservation has actually touched the lives of uh, Dalit community. And the first thing, when reservation is given in education, uh, and education is the only way through which Dalit community can grow or or move out of the situation. Uh, Almost 70%, 75% Dalits drop out by 10th class, which is like a basic level of education where they can actually claim the reservation benefits in the jobs, in the government jobs. And 70%, 75%, 80% girls drops out. Now only the 20% remaining is claiming the government jobs and moving into that. Now that number is constant for many, many years. And that number has not gone back, not actually included so many caste groups which are uh, educationally educationally backward. And if India has like 71% of literacy rate, there are caste groups which education are less than 10%. And there are girls who are like less than 5% educated among caste groups in several caste groups. Those are uh, also a situation. And also in the jobs, uh, uh, jobs market, we, we know and there are a lot of data available that, okay, how the backlogs and everything are not fi uh, filled, uh, filled properly. Uh, I want to uh, just bring like how it can be the annihilation of caste, how it can be uh, think through, uh, we can think through. The, the, the one important aspects I want to highlight here is that uh, India, uh, and as the number says that majority of India are affected by the caste based discrimination and majority of the population among them more than 62 percent belong like are under 30 years of age the the young population which are like aspiring to uh, uh, for a change or get out of the caste system and we need to really see uh, if annihilation of caste has to take place like how this what is the plan or what is the thinking around about these young people uh, in terms of their uh, their aspiration and their their growth, the second part of it is is that uh, the the inclusion which has to happen uh, is it the inclusion uh, will it actually happen uh, by the Dalit community or it has a both ways process? What is the what is the process of uh, bridging the gap between the Dalits and non Dalits? Uh, in terms of human relationship, in terms of ex in terms of their development, and that needs to be also seen 
uh, if we are talking about annihilation of caste from the both side of it is. And the third part, which we uh, keep uh, also saying, and I, we always use in our work on the ground, uh, we call it 5R of, uh, of recognizing uh, the inclusion process. The first R, which is that, that uh, like, do we recognize that there are there are subcaste, there are caste groups, there are different groups uh, in 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 context, which which are way below the average education or uh, access to health or access to market or capital, way below the uh, uh, numbers of average India. Uh, the second part of it is that like, do we have a mechanism to ensure that the respect and dignity happens? The third part is that do we have the mechanism to understand to bring the representation in different spheres of uh, of development, and do we have a reparative measurements available for this community when this comes because historical and it's it's longer, and then uh, at the last I call it what um, the Baba Sahib Ambedkar has said it like the reclamation of human personality is inclusion is a is is a way of uh, achieving the constitutional vision or uh, a right or it is, it is paternalistic uh, in the name of uh, inclusion. And uh, I also want to uh, uh, just bring one last example and close it that, uh, that uh, I mean, the, uh, any kind of, uh, and Chandvan sir has clearly said it also very, that, that the mobility may happen. Mobility, is, uh, mobility can take place through different measurements. And there are a lot of, lot of uh, examples available where where state and civil society and people are trying to bring that up. But the question which remains is that, are we really serious about actually bringing the human personality and reclamation of human personality of the Dalit community? Because Ambedkar has also said it very clearly that ours is not a battle, battle for wealth. It's a battle of reclamation of human personality. And, and if we understand that part of it is, uh, uh, the, the clear example is that like we have 1.3 million manual scavengers in, 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 and it's counted and it's, a, it's there in uh, India. Uh, if, if money would have solved the problem, uh, you would have removed uh, the manual scavenging practice from the India, which is the heinous crime. It's still, it's still being practiced uh, in large number. Uh, we have seen in COVID times uh, the, how the state and the market and the society has come together and actually we came out of the COVID in just one year of time and we all got vaccinated on a time. But why is it the intention not that, that we are able to remove the, the, the practice like manual scavenging from the Indian context from the Dalit community? So there are, there are, uh, uh, there are different questions and, uh, and aspects to see the annihilation of caste. But what I see by 2047 is that the, the young generation holds the, the belief that their aspirations can be uh, nurtured. And if that aspirations are nurtured well, and in all the spheres of the de uh, development, it's access to education, higher education, health, and uh, market access to market, and capital, and everything, it's all together will lead to uh, a creation of a generation which will really think of a, a, a change uh, society, and that generation holds the key to uh, annihilation of caste by 2050, as I, as I yeah. see. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Satyendra Kumar. That's a beautiful way of uh, putting it. Young generation holds the key for annihilation of uh, caste. You have touched uh, the NCRB data or the crimes. So as per the data presented in the parliament in 2019, there is no reservation in crimes, but SAs represent uh, the inmates, jail inmates represent 21% of the population of all the, all the jail inmates and STs represent 11.4%, whereas the population percent is 8 and 16, but they represent in the jail inmates more than that. So now uh, moving on, so uh, caste and gender, and the class caste by uh, blindness in uh, various areas and the identity assertion of uh, you know caste and the gender uh, how the assertion uh, can lead to annihilation of caste and what are the institutional and community mechanisms that are required for people to come out uh, as uh, 
easier for them to come out as uh, oppressed and uh, how that can lead to annihilation of cash. So, Eshika, uh, thank you for uh, being with us. Now, I request you to touch upon these aspects and how they can lead to annihilation of cash or any other uh, ways. Yeah, thank you so much for giving me this platform. I hope everybody can hear me clearly. Um, first of all, Jeb Beam, everybody, so ex excited to be here. Also, I was here in 2020. It's great to be back. Um, and also, compared to back then, I think we've really moved forward in the conversation. We're actively talking about annihilating caste by 2047. I personally don't think that goal is achievable by any means because 2047 is right here. Um, and the experiences that we have, the data that we read, that is indicating in every direction that we're not headed. And I'm, I apologize for being a pessimist, but I think it's important to keep things real. And it's important for us to acknowledge that this is not happening by 2047. We have completed 20, 75 years of India being independent. And uh, only now, caste has entered the conversation. So let's think of another 100 years, at least, when we can think about the word annihilation. Having said that, I am truly excited to be here because just this panel itself, to be with other Dalit speakers, Tan Mori, Satyendra, Chandravan Pasaji, it's just empowering to hear our own voices, to hear the data that everybody has presented. Chandrudu, you did such a great job with context setting because this is the data that has been hidden from us. This is the data that is not talked about. Media plays an important role in highlighting or suppressing that data. And I don't think anybody who is a part of this panel or is listening to this conversation needs to know um, the state of Indian media uh, at this moment. However, having said that, I think um, caste and gender, since that's the, the section that you want me to speak about, you know, is an intricate part of how we view caste. Dalit women, uh, I think it's evident, lie at the absolute bottom of the totem pole that we suffer not only because of caste, we suffer also because of gender and entrenched with the way patriarchy works, you know, Tenmori uses this excellent term a lot, Dalit patriarchy and, you know, uh, Brahminical patriarchy, um, it, you know, in her work. And I think it's a really good way to understand how the caste system imposes not only a segregation by Varnas, but also a segregation by gender. And when Dalit women who are at the bottom of this pyramid, they are forced to, you know, uh, they're forced to undergo discrimination basis of being women and basis of their caste. You know, uh, Satyendra, you talked about the NCRB data. I think when it comes to women, especially SC and ST women, Dalit and Adivasi women, they face the worst brunt of sexual crimes. They face, uh, you know, the kind of, violence, even from our own homes, the violence that Dalit women face is extreme and often not talked about. But talking just, you know, in terms of data, 7.64% of all cases just in 2021, the NCRB data suggested is, you know, uh, they're reported by Dalit women. And for Adivasi women, that data is even higher. 15% of all cases that are reported are just Adivasi women. And let's bear in mind that these are just they, these are just numbers that we have access to. Let's think about how this data is created. You know, we've talked over and over again, India lives in its villages. And if you think about the crimes, um, the sexual crimes, the violent crimes that happen against Dalit women in those areas, there is a culture of shielding the upper caste, the dominant caste, forward caste perpetrators, you know, the assaulters. There is, whether it's the police, whether it's the village administration, they, they, they form this patriarchal casteist wall to protect the perpetrators who are raping and who are assaulting and murdering Dalit young girls, Dalit women. And we've seen this over and over again. We saw this in the Hathras case, which was, you know, there have been, there have been several cases since the Hathras case, which happened in 2020. You know, the latest data is 45% of increase in crime between 2015 and 2020. 
So you can imagine the scale at which uh, crimes against Dalit women take place. However, at the level or the village level, the, the, the problem arises with just registering and getting Dalit women heard. You know, as in the Hathras case, without the media mobilization, without this becoming an issue online in particular, the girls' parents were having such a hard time even registering the first information report. Those of us who are, you know, from India, from South Asia, know that FIR, file in the police stations, is the first basis of registering a, a crime. But there has been data that says that the police is always often very hesitant in filing FIRs when it comes to especially Dalit women. You might remember the case that happened with the, twi the, the two sisters in Uttar Pradesh in 2013 or 2012 who were found hanging from a tree in Uttar Pradesh. It was extremely violent and extremely gruesome. And even in that case, you know, there's an excellent book that is written by this author called Sonia Fierro. Uh, it's called The Good Girls. And it goes into the details about how the police absolutely refused to file the report until the Dalit community banded around the police station for days. And then the police report was filed. But within that time when the crime happened and the, the report was filed, essential time is lost. Precious time that could be used to find the perpetrators, to find uh, data, to find evidence that is absolutely lost. So you have to understand that there is, a, there is complete apathy when it comes to the lives and dignity of Dalit women. You know, we've seen practices um i've talked about this in the book where you know the the right of the landlord of a land in particular in villages also is the right over the dalit worker and his wife so we have seen cases we have heard cases where um you know the landlord will be you know has open access to assaulting a Dalit woman and her husband has no choice but to comply. There is this horrible tradition in certain parts of the country where if the landlord is raping uh, a Dalit woman, uh, her husband will know not to enter the, the house because the footwear, the chappals, you know, the shoes of the landlord are kept outside uh, the, the hut. So if you think about, you know, um, who actually suffers in this, um, in this totem pole of this noxious, toxic, you know, combination of patriarchy and caste, it's essentially Dalit women. And also, let's think about the kind of victim blaming, the kind of victim shaming that comes with just having being raped, having being sexually assaulted, and that that doesn't just limit us to urban uh, to villages but even in urban areas you can think about you know apples to apples if we compare the case of nirbhaya the case of jyoti sharma now that you know may she rest in peace but we can talk about her name uh, was covered in such a different way compared to how cases of dalit women have been covered for years and years, whether they belong in urban areas, whether they belong in villages, we see this kind of disparity with, you know, Satyendra talked about who we think of us as our own, you know, the, who the media thought was one of their own. They always, you know, the biases that we have highlighted that exist in bureaucracy, judiciary, media, these kind of big pillars of our democracy, they, ha they are so entrenched that they only um, their heart only bleeds seemingly for folks who they think resemble their own kind. And I think this is an important issue that finally um, I'm excited that we have a platform to talk about because it has taken us this far from, you know, if you think about the history of how caste, the caste movement has evolved in, in India you know, from the 90s until now, there was a big spike. There was there was a huge spike in um, caste hatred in the anti-reservation statement in particular, because in urban areas that directly correlates to how we perceive caste, you know, with the Mandal Commission uh, uprising that, that we saw in the early 90s. I'm sure most of us here don't remember it, but some of us who did witness that, 
remember that there was such a huge agitation to just increasing the affirmative action that would go to you know uh, oppressed people and people were ready to kill themselves there was a particular case where a student lit himself on fire because he did not want um you know oppressed people to get access to education that the you know upper caste former caste people have been getting frankly for centuries and you know even there i think when it comes to dalit women one of the things that we need to talk about is the you know the failures of indian feminism frankly because um indian feminists have adopted this lens which only looks at caste at class which only looks at geographical location they look at the divides between you know what class a certain person belongs to whether they live in the villages a tier two town or they live in urban areas but what they don't talk about is caste you know bhavri devi for those of us who are aware was one of the landmark cases which allowed um, you know which allowed workplace rights to women which allowed you know right protections to women against workplace harassment and sexual assault but when the bhavri devi case came about her caste was often denied or invisibilized or erased only now you know this case took place in the late 90s we were able to go back and offer that lens of how um the feminist movement has failed to acknowledge that dalit women have frankly have it so much worse and that you know even with the reservation uh, the anti reservation movement that happened during mandal commission era in the 90s it was upper caste feminists you know we talk about the urban versus village divide upper caste feminists from so called elite colleges like miranda house and delhi university and other colleges actually rallied and said that they will not be able to find good husbands because uh, of reservation because you know for them the feminism was limited to finding a good match to finding a good suitor and like there are so, we can we can count the ways that that statement is problematic in terms of endogamy and their insistence on marrying somebody from their own caste their insistence on you know their lives being defined by who they get to marry and the fact that they had no solidarity with dalit women whatsoever so that movement in itself i feel is extremely fractured and you know that itself i think contributes to the class the caste blindness that we see all around us in india and of course in 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 american communities um i think one of the ways that you know if we talk about urban modernity specifically the way caste blindness has evolved one of the things for us to keep in mind is that this you know post 1947 post independence there was a whole project that was created especially when india was presented to the world at the global stage as this new shining secular beacon of hope and in that project uh, Uh, yes sorry for the uh, interruption uh, can you uh, just Absolutely. Uh, yeah time is uh, you know uh, uh, running out can you uh, conclude the, in the next one or so minute absolutely yeah. i'll try my best yeah please um so the point that i was making was that the modernity project made sure that caste had no space on the global stage when it came to the india story and we're seeing the effects of that till today we're seeing how um you know in the us uh, as we all know there is an extreme denial to acknowledge caste back in india mr tharoor mr shashi tharoor just made a statement on twitter i think two days ago when he questioned whether caste even exists and why was it necessary for the government in kerala to allow free access to libraries to scst students scheduled caste and scheduled tribe students so even at that level even among indian liberals who are elite we see uh, just this absolute willful ignorance to understand how caste functions and before i wrap i just love to quickly talk about why identity assertion is important or what the government can do i think there is major disparity that exists when it comes to housing when it comes to employment when it comes to education we have seen scst students are routinely discriminated in schools and colleges and universities we have seen we don't get 
housing access. Um, Dalit communities are not even a part of urban planning in India. And until these institutional barriers exist, um, it is almost impossible for people to assert their caste, their dignity and assert their caste while being Dalit. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Jessica. So that was uh, a very pertinent uh, points. Jatpat uh, Todak Mandal, where uh, the never uh, spoken uh, annihilation of caste text by Dr. Ambedkar. And now it's al almost uh, more than uh, 80 years. Now you are saying it might take another 100 years uh, uh, for anywhere to reach uh, to annihilation of caste. So thank you for that wonderful, uh, you know, uh, discussion. Now uh, moving on uh, to our next uh, uh, panelist, uh, Tenmuri. Caste has become a global uh, issue now, and uh, the global solid solidarity and uh, the solidarity uh, or the allyship uh, from other countries and uh, from the diaspora play a, a very uh, important role in realizing caste and gender equality. Uh, for annihilation of uh, caste, which uh, Tenmoli is like you know doing uh, in her uh, own way, and combining this uh, another uh, question uh, in the same uh, uh, one: How do we heal from the trauma of caste? How the allyship look like, and also how do we uh, heal from the trauma of caste, and so that we can uh, annihilate uh, caste? Yeah, over to Tenmoli. Thank you. And J. Beam and J. Savitri, everyone, it's an honor to be here with all these panelists and with you all here today. Um, I think what's just very important and a theme that runs from every speaker here is there is no dearth of data that shows that caste depressed people suffer under development by every indicator of development. And we don't actually have to tell you the data anymore. We need to act. And I think what's profound is that we are seeing caste depressed people across all of the countries of South Asia. And we are also seeing caste depressed people experience significant discrimination in diasporic countries everywhere that South Asians have gone. And the reality is we actually know from a development perspective how you remedy this. You pass laws to stop and ban the discrimination, and then you invest in the underdevelopment populations so that they can come to be in equity with the other communities. The only reason we're not doing this is because of a lack of political will. It's not data. <laughs> It's not that we don't have significant stories. In fact, I'm sure every Harvard India conference, we've had a panel which shares even more data about this issue. It's about political will. And it's also about the fragility of the dominant caste to actually listen and fully witness to the consequences of what has occurred related to caste. So for me, I mean, I, I would disagree with Yashika in that end is I don't think we need a hundred years in that end because we've seen that in the face of a pandemic, the world can make radical choices if it has a political will to survive itself as a species. And I think similarly around caste, the only people who are ringing the alarm around caste are the excluded. We know it's a survival issue for us. What dominant caste people don't realize, it is also a survival issue for your people. And that's because caste is also one of the biggest wastes of human capital at a time when we need to unleash the development potential of South Asia. And so I would say that one of the things that we really need to look at as development professionals is what are the ways that we can make strategic interventions in education, in, uh, in women's development, in terms of capital and businesses, um, all of these uh, places where we're in public health, all of these places where we're seeing underdevelopment, investment can be the strong answer. And I think what's very interesting is, is that we are able to have a more open conversation in the diaspora about caste because we are not being muzzled 
by uh, dominant castes who are are stuck in their um, denial of caste. And so I think what we've seen is we've been able to get data across many different institutions, whether it's caste in tech, caste in education, or caste broadly in the diaspora, that is transforming the way intergovernmental institutions look at this question um, of caste equity. So I think that what is really important is we need to move beyond the, the question of the burden of proof when it comes to caste discrimination and start to understand where does the fragility come from? And that's a large part of what I looked at um, in my book, The Trauma of Caste, because, you know, if any, you know, as any of the activists here can speak to, the minute a Dalit speaks about the issue of caste, you will face blowback. You will face gaslighting. You will face death threats. You will face rape threats. You will face... Um, and you will face some form of counter case or whatever. I think one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is why is that part of the process? Especially when there's evidence, there's data, there's research, and there's copious personal anecdotes. And I don't think that dominant caste people have actually sat down and asked themselves, why is there so much bigotry in my professional networks, in my family? in my religious institutions. And that's a courageous conversation you have to have first with yourself and then with the people that you care about. Because when you start to ask and start to dig into why people are bigoted, you get to a whole other conversation related to historical trauma. And that's um, you know where there's been tremendous contributions by black and indigenous and people of color scholars in countries like the United States, where they've seen systems of exclusion like caste and race through the lens of intergenerational trauma. And, you know, what thinkers like Eduardo Duran and Resma Menachem speak about is that these systems operate like soul wounds, where both the privileged and the oppressed are engaged and have some sort of different experience of that trauma. For the for those that are oppressed, you've actually heard what our trauma looks like, the, the extreme violence, the exclusion, the tremendous amount of caste stress as we try to integrate institutions that want to, to kill us. But at, for the caste privilege, there is also a violence. That is the violence of complicity, of what it means to dehumanize other people. Because when you dehumanize one, you also dehumanize yourself. And that's the place where we need to be able to have a slower conversation, because if we could just solve caste with the discussion of politics and economics and workshops and books, we would have done that. I mean, imagine all of the books of Dr. Ambedkar, just his, you know, his lineage. We have every tool that we need to understand how to take apart caste. The reason why we haven't done it is that the fragility of the dominant caste are what are slowing down the flow of civil rights progress. And in many ways, it comes down to the conditioning of nervous systems. You know, for many dominant caste people, when you bring up a conversation related to caste, their nervous systems view caste equity as a survival level threat. So that someone who is Dalit at the same equitable table with them is frightening for them. And it's uncomfortable. But discomfort is not the same as discrimination. And that's why we're having two different conversations as a community. Cast oppressed people are asking for an implementation of the rule of law. Don't discriminate against us. Stop the bigotry and watch how we succeed. Cast privileged people are staying in their feelings and saying, I'm afraid of what happens if caste equity were to occur. That's why in the Mundell Commission, you had dominant caste people setting themselves on fire if OBCs got reservation. Just imagine the ludicrousness of that. The problem of having limited access to opportunity isn't solved by setting yourself on fire. It's by investing in creating enough opportunity for all people. And with the context of the South Asian countries, you know, our generations that are, you know, that are 20 and uh, and up, you know, we have a tremendous unleashed potential there if we invested in education and allowed equal access to all institutions for all. 
And that's all caste oppressed people are asking for. And yet what you see in the diaspora is that, you know, when dominant caste people try to do the same tactics that they use back at home, you know, whether it's like hysterics or trying to say that adding caste as a protected category will lead to Hindu phobia or other such kind of, you know, hysterical, um, fr fragile statements, they are not really listened to by American administrators because that's not the way civil rights works. Protected categories, things that prevent discrimination and violence only target the bigoted. That's it. If you aren't bigoted, you won't be impacted. So it's really time that when we're talking about allyship and the things that we need from dominant caste people, we need folks to stop uh, letting their, their, their friends and their families who are bigots to slow the conversation related to uh, what it need, what is required to abolish caste. And in many ways that requires speaking up in your family networks. It requires bringing this issue up in your professional networks. So for example, in the Harvard conference, is caste a, a listed as a protected category um, in terms of the non-discrimination clauses as part of the code of conduct here? You could also add it in terms of your institutions. Many intergovernmental institutions now are running caste um, diversity and equity initiatives. And our organization, Equality Labs, has conducted many trainings with some of these intergovernmental orgs, as well as you know, large-scale corporations and nonprofits. Simple things like changing the policy ensure that your organization is a welcome place for all. And then positive investments can, can in terms of coaching and um, ex inclusion. Sorry, what was that? Yeah, so time is, you know, the allotted time of seven, eight minutes is, uh, you know, over. Can you, can you just wrap it up, please? Yes, I will keep it really simple. Invest, invest, invest in caste equity and stop the fragility and make sure that you add CAD, caste as a protected category. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, concluding sort of uh, one-liner uh, as to what needs to be done from now onwards. So I thank uh, the panel uh, uh, members. Uh, your uh, uh, discussion has enriched the audience and uh, here and uh, elsewhere. So the laws, urbanization and capitalism as told by Chandraban Prasad and reclamation of the human personality and reparative measures and grassroots empowerment and uh, the need to act, the younger generation holds the key and the need to act uh, as quickly and uh, do the work it's not a win-win, win-lose for uh, the caste oppressed and caste oppressor. It's a win-win for everybody if we take, you know, bring in equality and uh, caste equity as uh, told by Athen Moli. So this is a uh, wonderful uh, uh, conclusion. Hopefully uh, everybody in their respective areas uh, will be taking uh, these measures. We will not be uh, taking uh, any questions. Uh, we are like, you know, uh, uh, there is no time uh, for that. So with this, I thank uh, everyone, Chandra Banji, Satyendra, and Ashika, and Tenmoli, and all the people present here, and the organizers. Thank you for this wonderful uh, occasion. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, do you have a minute? Dear sir, do you have a minute? I wanted to uh, just add something which I forgot. Yes, please. You know, so far as uh, violence is concerned, if I remember my childhood, upper caste practiced violence individually, individual, individuals, because a lati was enough to control the entire Dalit hamlet. Today, they need organized effort and rifles to control the needs. I think uh, this is a milestone uh, change. Yeah. And of course, caste, uh, we have a Purana old Kila in Delhi. It is there, but it has no meaning. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful uh, analogy. Thank you, everyone.